once saved, always saved. This topic has enraged fights all over the world in the body of Christ. Now, I rather prefer truly safe, always safe, because that's a bit more theologically accurate. And this is according to the great theologian Norman Geiser. In fact, he says it is a non-essential doctrine and should never be a topic for the church to be divided over. When Jesus was born and he came, who was he fighting? He wasn't fighting the devil. He defeated the devil on the cross. He was fighting religion and tradition continually. The works doctrine, the Pharisees that said they fast, they pray, they give, they do all these works to get into heaven. And what Jesus did, he continually raised the standard to say, listen, it doesn't matter what you do. It is easier for a camel to enter into the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. He was simply saying, hey, it is impossible to get there without me. So I want to get into a few points to explain to you why I believe our salvation is eternally secure and we can never lose our salvation if it is true. Number one, there is an eternal record about you. 1 John 5, 11, going on to 13, it says, and this is the testimony, the record, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. You see, he's speaking yet about an eternal record that says that we are saved and we know that we are saved. It gives us an assurance. When we speak about the grace of God, there are diversities of the grace of God. You have prevenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace, glorifying grace. And a lot of people confuse justifying grace with sanctifying grace. When we speak about eternal salvation, we're speaking about the justification part of grace, not the sanctification. So we're not giving people a license to sin and saying it's good to carry on, saying nothing's going to happen. There is consequences for your sin. And that consequence is that we will not be conformed to the image of the Son. The breaking of our fellowship with God is going to take place. Blessings are going to be removed. Favor is going to be removed. A lot of things are going to be removed, but it doesn't remove your salvation. Let's go to the second point. You have double security in the hands of God. John chapter number 10 verse 27 says, going to on to 30, it says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Now listen to this. They shall never, you shall never perish. So first of all, if we say we can lose our salvation, we're making Jesus a liar. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand, Jesus saying, my Father even who is greater, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And I and my Father is one. So now we're saying that we are not only in the hands of Jesus, but also in the hands of the Father. We're seeing a double security being taken place here. If anyone can, that means that God is no longer omnipotent. He's no longer all powerful. We're removing the very divine attributes of the divine nature, which is the omnipotency, the omniscience and the omnipresence of God, which is the ultimate blasphemy. So that is why he's saying no one can, including ourselves. If you're enjoying this video so far, I want to ask you right now, subscribe to our channel, like this video right now, share this video with as many people as you can, get their input on this. Drop me a comment below on what you're standing on, what side of the doctrine you're standing on. Number three, we are eternally sealed. Ephesians chapter number one verse 13 says, In Him you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, okay, after you got saved, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee, the down payment, a deposit of our inheritance until our redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. What he is saying, he's saying, listen, the Lord purchased you by His blood. And by purchasing with you His blood, the day of redemption is coming where He's going to redeem you and actually own you, take possession of you completely when you receive your glorified body. But he said, until that day comes, He has given you a down payment, like you would give a down payment for a house. If you don't come through with a deal, guess what? You lose your down payment. You lose the surety. So he's saying, I've given you the Holy Spirit as a surety that I can guarantee you I will not lose you. 
I am so confident in you. I gave you a part of me. I gave you this Holy Spirit. How can the Holy Spirit go to hell? Let's get to point number four. The devil cannot touch you. Sin cannot touch you. Now, now I'm touching on a very simple topic, but now I'm getting into a little bit of new creation realities because yes, can Christians get demonized? Absolutely. It's when they don't understand the finished work of the cross. They get into legalism. They don't understand who they are, their victory, their overcoming status. They don't understand those things. They're opening up certain doors. They don't have faith and they doubt and the devil comes in through that. 1 John chapter number 3 verse 9 says, whoever has been born of God does not sin. Have you been born of God? Are you born from above? That means you cannot sin. For his seed remains in him. God's seed is in you. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Now I understand the scripture also says he who is of no sin is a liar. says he has no sin is a liar. But we need to look at the context of these scriptures. He's saying that what sin used to be to you has no longer that hold over you. What sin used to do to you before salvation cannot do to you anymore. Does that give us a license to sin? Absolutely not. Because sin will still break your fellowship with God. 1 John 5, 18. It says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. But he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. Now, but actually says in the Greek that God keeps him. So the devil cannot touch you. Sin cannot touch you because God keeps you in His power. And I want you to get this revelation. Point number five, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Romans 8 verse 38 to 39 says, Paul is saying, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate me from God's love in Christ, only if you are saved. Listen, that means nothing. No devil, no hell, no heaven, no person, no situation, no circumstance. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Let's get to point number six. If you work, you no longer have grace. If you have grace, you no longer work. I'm not giving you an opinion. I'm giving you scripture. Romans 4 verse 4 to 5 says, Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Let's go to Romans 11 6. We have to interpret this verse with Romans 11 verse 6. It says, And if by grace then it is no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. So if our work is no longer grace, and if it's grace, it's no longer work. So if it's grace, it must be grace. If it's work, it is only work. So my grace can only be grace if it's fully grace. And there's no balance when it comes to grace and work. By uh, Moses came the law, but by Christ Jesus came grace and truth. But in the Greek, it says grace, then truth. Meaning, it's first grace that you understand grace, then you'll understand the truth of God. You can never understand grace by only knowing truth. Point number seven, salvation is eternal. This is very important because the moment we believe that we can lose our salvation, we lose the essence and the meaning of the word eternal and everlasting. See, John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Another translation says, shall have eternal life, not temporal life. So when He came to give you salvation, it's not temporal. It's not something you're going to lose. It's not going to give you for a short time. It is going to be eternal. Point number eight. Even if you want to deny Him, He keeps you. 2 Timothy 2.11 it says, this is a, going on to 13, it says, this is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Then it goes into something very powerful. It says, he cannot deny himself. Now who lives inside of us? Christ lives in us. So he cannot deny himself in us. And it doesn't matter if you stop believing, he abides faithful. Even if you stop believing, you are still secure. 
because God knows your weaknesses. Listen, it's like a child. How many times have your children come to you and say, oh, you're no longer my parents, I'm leaving in you, and you're laughing inside of you because you know. How many of you, when you got saved a month, in two months, and even three months, even even later in your salvation, many, most of you said, God, I'm not believing in you anymore. I'm, I'm leaving this Christian faith thing. Things are just going too tough. I'm leaving it. You're going back into the world. And guess what? You cannot stop hearing that voice, the convicting voice, the disciplinary voice, the smiting voice of the Lord, trying to discipline you and trying to chastise you to come back to him because even though you deny him he cannot deny you and he knew that when you were at the point of prevenient grace when you accepted the message of the gospel and you didn't reject him he knew you were in your total full senses there and he knew there's going to come other times when you will not be in your fully good senses like the Bible is saying that God would grant repentance to many of the Gentiles, there's no reprobate mind and many will come to their senses and so on. And we see that decisions can be made in good senses and not good senses. God knew that there'll be times when you're gonna be drunk, when you're gonna be not in a good mental faculty or capability, and you're gonna make some foolish decision and say, God, I deny you. And in that His grace is still there to know that, no, 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 there was a time when you were fully aware, when you made that decision, my blood sealed you, my Holy Spirit sealed you. This is the, too good to be true news. 1 Peter 1 verse 5 says, who are kept, us, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. This is called the keeping power of God. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, for the day of salvation, ready to be presented, to be revealed in the last time. The very fact that you need a savior means that you could never save yourself. The very fact that we need a savior means there's nothing we could do to ever earn salvation or keep it. It is like a lifeguard that is coming to save you as you're drowning in the ocean or in waters. He comes, he takes you, he picks you up and he begins to swim out. And their advice to you would be not to swim or do anything. Just lean on them and they're gonna carry you out. Now, when you struggle and you resist and you try to swim on your own, they'll tell you to stop because they need to get to the point of possession, to the point of the promise, the land, the seashore. And then if you keep on fighting, what a lifeguard is trained to do is to punch you unconscious. So they can have you unconscious and can get you out of the ocean and the wild waves so that there's no struggle from your side. And this is the image of our Savior Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves or to keep our salvation. We lean upon Him and we put our faith totally in Him, not in our own works. So let's get to point number nine. A son is forever. You see John chapter number one verse 12, but as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God. John 8 verse 35 says, a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. So a son is forever, not temporal. The fact that we have eternal life is forever. We don't have temporal life. We have eternal life. We shall never perish. Let's get to point 10, the backslider's judgment, as I like to call it. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 verse 1. Very important to take note of this first verse. It says, and I, brethren, remember Paul is calling them brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. He says, you're still weak, still young, you're babies, you're carnal, but you're my brothers. But they were only called brethren if they were truly saved. Now, if we jump to verse 13, he's speaking about those who are backsliding, but they are still brethren. Verse 13 is saying, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it'll be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burnt, he will receive suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Paul is speaking that to the carnal, that means the backslider. I call this the judgment of the backslider. The Bible says, fire is for your works, not for you. It says the fire will burn the works around you, but you will be saved. It is good news. If you backslid, what happened? You are forever, heaven is there. But you break your fellowship with the Lord on earth, you break blessings, favor is removed, blessings is removed, His manifest presence is removed, it'll feel like you're going to hell. So when you stand in front of Him at an eternal judgment day, you will lose an eternal reward and you will have an eternal regret with an eternal embarrassment for eternity to see. 
That is why a backsliding position is so horrible. It means we are out of the house, we are still a son, but we are not in the presence. We have broken fellowship with the Lord and He's calling us back. Let's get to point number 11. Even if you grieve the Holy Spirit, you are sealed. Am I endorsing a license to sin? Absolutely not. Sin has consequences, but the sin issue has been dealt with on the cross. Ephesians 4 verse 30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So we even see a Christian that grieves the Holy Spirit go to heaven. So never kid yourself and say that, um, you know, a sin doesn't allow us to enter into heaven. You and I are sinning every day. That is why we need the blood of Jesus Christ. Can you repent after every sin? It is impossible. Do I have to ask forgiveness to the Father for making a mistake and sinning in certain areas? Absolutely. So that my fellowship and relationship can be restored. Let's get to point number 12. Even sinning Christians get to heaven. Am I giving you a license to sin? Absolutely not. You had a license to sin before you came watching this video. You were sinning before you were watching this video and you're even sinning right now. Many of you, because you're getting so upset with me in this video that you are sinning and you're still going to go to heaven. So even a sinning Christian goes to heaven. I'm going to give you some scriptures on this. And I want to make clear, I'm not giving a license to sin. I'm not telling you to go and sin. I'm not saying it is okay to sin. I gave you the consequences of sin. So let's handle this like mature Christians, but let's accept the reality that uh, there might be a time that you pass away without repenting of something. I heard a testimony of a minister saying that he was in an argument with his wife, got into a car, left home, and was very angry. And he got into an accident. He died. He had this experience where he went to heaven. And the Lord said they're not allowed to enter heaven because they had unforgiveness against their wife because of the argument. Now this violates every scriptural basis and law of the gospel of grace and good news that Paul came to preach. Am I saying his experience was false? I can't judge that. I can judge it on scripture, but it doesn't line up with scripture. Something silly. Imagine you forget to repent about a sin and you get to heaven. The Lord is saying, I don't care what you've done. Even if you minister to thousands and to millions, you miss this one thing. You're going to go to hell. You foolish, lazy servant. God becomes a scam artist. He promises you, gives you all these promises. You're going to have eternal life for only for you to get there and to realize you're never earning it. Listen, that is bad news. That is not good news. We are here to present the good news to you. I want to make this point also. If you really experience the grace, the power, the salvation of Christ, you would not want to go and sin. And even if you do and you will, you will feel the discipline of God. You will feel the chastising power of God. So you will not go on and sin and just do it because now you can insult the spirit of grace. That doesn't count for those who are truly saved. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 verse 19. Again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ, Paul is saying, but we do all things beloved. Remember, he was speaking to the Corinthian church and he calls them beloved. Whenever Paul calls someone beloved, he's speaking about somebody that is in the beloved, in the body of Christ, somebody that is saved. Now listen to this. He says, but we do all things beloved for your edification. For I fear less when I come, I shall not find you as such as I wish, and that I shall be found you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, tumults. Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many of you, because you have sinned and have not repented of the uncleanness, or oh, uncleanness, fornication, lewdness, which they have practiced. Now we see, Christians who were practicing these sins, but yet they were called the beloved, practicing fornication, but they were practicing it, feeling the discipline of God. It was not like they were not Christians. They were Christians, but Paul wanted to come and get them back into the fellowship. He says, listen, you're going to live a horrible life on this earth and your life can be cut short. So I'm coming to plead with you to get out of that lifestyle. But yet he calls them the beloved. So these were sins that Christians didn't repent of. The word repent means to simply change my mind. It doesn't mean to change from sin. If it means to change from sin, it means that God had sin twice in the Bible because the Bible mentions that God repented twice. So repentance means to change my mind so that I can ask for forgiveness, to receive the forgiving power of God for salvation. A person still is saved even though there are things in his life which he didn't repent of because there are things in your life that you haven't repented of and you are still saved. So you can say you must repent of every sin, but what about the sins? Like I said, you don't know, I've forgotten about. See, it doesn't make sense. Now some of you can say, but this is too good to be true. This, this means I can just go out and do whatever I want. I want to challenge you, go and try it. If you are a truly born again child of God, go and try. You're not going to get it right. 
you're going to go do, but you're going to hear the voice of God screaming at you. You're going to begin to see the loss of blessings. You're going to see the consequences of sin coming to you. But so, Leon, this is too good to be true news. Absolutely. Nobody could get you out of this position that you were in that was defeated, death, that was completely deprived to a place of salvation, which you and I never deserved. Is the too good to be true news. Let's get to point 13. Even a really wicked sin committed cannot remove you from heaven. Mm, they're getting heavier. 1 Corinthians 5 is 1. Paul is saying, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles. That a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you might be removed out of your fellowship, might lose out the blessing and the promises and all these things. For I indeed, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of argument on this verse. Okay, there are many different theological camps. I'm just presenting to you the word. I'm taking this verse in context of all the other 40, 50 verses I'm mentioning. So here we see Paul is saying, he's speaking about somebody who committed a really wicked sin. Yet he's saying they are still saved. Their spirit will be saved, but we're handing them over for the destruction of their flesh that they can repent and come back into the fellowship. And we actually see later on the letter that they actually received this man back, but that he can repent because so that he can get back into the fellowship, into the blessing, that he can live a life that will give him eternal rewards. So he's been handed over for the destruction of his flesh. So most wicked and heinous sins committed by a saved Christian, yet he is still saved. And you can say, but that one is so wicked. What about the adultery in your heart? What about the hatred in your heart towards another brother? Jesus said it is the same as committing physical adultery. Jesus raised the bar to say, listen, there's no degree, there's no standard. Sin is sin. You have different aspects to the law. We have the moral law, the mosaic law, and civil law. A lot of people confuse the mosaic law with moral law and the moral law with civil law. The civil law has not done away with, neither has it been fulfilled. The moral law has not been done away with, neither has it been fulfilled. But the Mosaic law has been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. So there's no measure to sin. That's why Jesus kept lifting the standard. He would have kept lifting it to make it impossible for anybody to fulfill. Because he tried to bring the picture through to say, hey, you need me as your savior. Point number 14, he saved you to the uttermost. Hebrews chapter number seven, verse 25 says, therefore, he is also able to save you to the uttermost, those who come to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Since he always lived to make intercession for them. He saves you to the uttermost. The word uttermost in Greek is pantelos. It means this, completely, all-encompassing, perfectly, absolutely, and forever. So let me reread this verse to you. It says, therefore, he is also able to save you to the uttermost, to save you completely, to save you all-encompassing, to save you perfectly, to save you absolutely, and to save you forever. Isn't that good news? And it's even going to get better. Listen to point number 15. You have the perfect lawyer and advocate. This for me is one of my favorite verses. 1 John 2 verse 1 says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. If you can lose your salvation, it means Jesus lost a court case. It means he is a failed lawyer, a failed advocate, and he could not able to stand up for you. And we know he isn't. We know he's the best advocate, the best lawyer. Point number 16, there will be no judgment against you as a believer. But Leon Wester, where's the verse? John 5, 24 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me 
has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. I promise you this 80, 90% that's watching this video that really truly believed that they're gonna one day stand in front of the Father and the Father's gonna ask him, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why did you did this sin? That is totally contrary to the good news and the gospel that we've been presented and, and, and have accepted. The Bible says when we stand in front of the Father, he's gonna see one person, one person only, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, because you are washed in his blood. So he's gonna look not at Peter, not at James, not at John, not at Ben, not at this one. He's gonna look at his son. He's gonna see the blood of his son on you and he's going to say and because of that you have the best lawyer the best advocate in a courtroom setting and the judge is going to acquit you because sin is not imputed upon you uh, a righteousness is imputed upon you he's going to look at you and he's going to acquit you of everything you are justified already and you're entering he's not going to say why did you do this why did you do that there's going to be no judgment so the scripture says you shall not come into judgment so you never have to be afraid of judgment day the bible says for believers we have a reward a prize giving day at the bema seat of christ we're going to come literally like running a race stepping up to the bema and we're going to come and stand there and prizes are going to be handed out for what we have done and the purpose and the will of god we have fulfilled on this earth in order to enter into our eternal reward and we're going to receive crowns and many other prizes so point number 17 he has dealt with the sins of the whole world already. But Leo, now you're sounding like a universalist. Now you're sounding like inclusiveness, the doctrine of inclusivity. No, 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 no. I'm not saying everyone is going to go to heaven. I'm saying the work has been done on the cross already. Now what it does is it takes for people, unbelievers, to believe in the work that has already been done. That is already the blood has already been shed. It takes their faith to believe in that. It, took, it takes us to be preaching to them. And as we preach to them, they believe this gospel and then they step into the propitiation that has been done and uh, that has been done for our sins. Let me, let me read to you this verse, 1 John 2 verse 1. It says, my little children, these things are righteous so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. But listen to verse 2. And he himself, the advocate, he himself, Jesus Christ, is the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So we see that this blood has been shed for the sins of the whole world, but for them to tap into it, into that forgiving power, they have to believe the gospel. Point number 18, you will be holy at His coming. In fact, I can really get into that you are already holy if we get into new creation realities. 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 13 says, He will establish your heart blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Point number 19, when I doubt my salvation, I am sinning. Romans 14 verse 23 says, But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. So now we see really what is the classification of sin in the New Testament. It is whatever is not of faith. John chapter 20 verse 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, he's speaking to Thomas, he said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed, but I say, blessed are those who have not seen and yet they have believed. They have not doubted, but they have just believed of faith. Luke 12 verse 29 says this, and do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. So what does double-mindedness bring? It brings an anxious mind. Paul was just using that just to explain some larger aspects of our faith and of salvation and living this life. He was just using food as an example. So what is happening? When I live in doubt of my salvation, I am not in faith or full assurance and I live in sin. The Bible says that when our heart condemns ourselves, we are actually in sin because we don't have that full assurance. So when you live a life in doubting, you are actually sinning against God. Because sin is unbelief. Now people are saying, but what about if I willful sin? There's no reward, repentance and so on. Well, brother, you are already sinning because you don't know if your salvation is true or not. And you don't have a surety that you're gonna go to heaven. At least I can sit here and I know that I know 100% absolute assurance that I am going to heaven. Those who believe they can lose their salvation, they are living in doubt and they are living in sin. Be assured of your salvation. Point number 20. And I want to say this. Jesus said on the cross, It is finished. It is done. 
It is a done deal. It is finished. I want you to be rest assured in your salvation. I want you to be rest assured in the finished work of Christ. Now, if you watch this video and you're saying, I don't have any of these things. I really battle. I don't have this assurance of my salvation. I want to pray with you right now. And I want you to take all the scriptures that I've given you. Make it a basis of your salvation and your faith that you may leave this video knowing that heaven is your home, knowing you are heaven bound, knowing you are saved. But those who are saying, I'm not sure of my salvation. In fact, maybe you're saying, you're saying you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never accepted the gospel. You've never said yes to the gospel message. I want to tell you right now, you cannot be assured of your future, but one thing you can be assured of is your salvation. But Jesus came at least with one assurance and he says, I'm coming with a message to tell you, you can be assured of one thing, that if you believe in me, if you put your faith in me and you put your faith in the blood and the blood that I shed upon the cross and on the finished work of the cross, you can be assured of your eternal home. You can be assured of your salvation. So if you've never accepted salvation or you're not assured of your salvation, pray this prayer with me, repeat after me. Say with me, say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to you. I acknowledge I am a sinner. I acknowledge that I have sinned against you in heaven. I've sinned against myself. I acknowledge that without you as my savior, I cannot attain salvation and I can never reach heaven. I'm totally deprived, completely deprived of any redemption. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I acknowledge today that I need you as my savior. And I am not putting my faith in this sinner's prayer, but I'm putting my faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm putting my faith in the finished work of the cross, knowing that you have died for my sins. You are raised again. You're seated at the right hand side of the Father, that you are the best advocate, best lawyer, that I'm washed clean by your blood. And today I receive your blood. Today I receive forgiveness for my sins. I believe that I am washed. I believe that I'm forgiven and heaven is my home. I believe that I am a child of God and by the power of God, I am made a child and a son and a daughter of God in Jesus mighty name. From this moment forward, heaven is my destination. I'm rest assured in my salvation and it can never be taken from me. Amen. Amen. It is as simple as that. Remember your faith is not in the prayer, your faith is in the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the finished work and what is done for you on the cross. God bless you. Comment below if you enjoyed this video.